All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, I see we've got folks continuing to join, um, but we're at we're at 701. We're so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is John Robertson. I'm the communication specialist at the Potsdam Area Health and Wellness Foundation, and welcome to the Tri County Health Council's Town Hall: A Healthy Return to School, COVID-19, and Routine Vaccinations for Children. Uh, we have a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, you can control your individual view by clicking the view option in the top right corner of your Zoom window. Uh, closed captioning is available located in the black bar at the bottom of your Zoom window under the More menu. Please use the Q&A function to ask any questions you might have for the panel and use the chat feature for any technical assistance you need as we, as we go through the session. An alternate live, screen, live stream is available through TCN's uh, Tri-County Community Network's Facebook page. And we'll, we'll share the recording um, of this event, the full event, with all, all the participants who registered. The recording will also be featured on our event page at potsdownfoundation.org slash town hall, along with more resources on a safe return to school. And with that, I'll just take a moment to share some information about the Tri-County Health Council. The council's mission is to improve the health and health care of area residents through collaboration, enhanced provider communication, and innovative patient engagement. Found in 2013, the council is made up of five partner institutions, Community Health and Dental Care, Gated Health Services, Pottstown Hospital Tower Health, Tri-County Community Network, and Pottstown Area Health and Wellness Foundation. For tonight's town hall, we're grateful to have as our moderator and education leader, many of you already know, former Pottstown School District Superintendent, Dr. Jeff Sparagano. Over the course of his 23-year career with Pottstown School District, Dr. Sparagana serves as a teacher, a high school head football coach, middle and elementary school principal, and the district superintendent, in addition to his many other roles in the district and those years of service to Pottstown students. So thanks for joining us for this conversation, Jeff, and I'll hand it over to you. Thanks very much, John. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I am Jeff Sparagan, a retired superintendent from Pottstown School District and a Pottstown Area Health and Wellness Foundation board member. I'm pleased to be with you this evening to moderate this very important conversation with the focus of this town hall being COVID-19 and routine vaccines for children, what you as parents need to know. I will review the agenda, have our panelists introduce themselves, and then I will pose a series of questions to our panelists as well as ask them to respond to any questions sent in in advance or that have been put in the chat followed by closing comments. But first I'd like you to meet our outstanding counsel. First, Kimberly Perry Malloy will please introduce yourself to our audience. Hi, I'm Kimberly Perry Malloy. I'm the district head nurse for Pottstown School District. Um, I've been the school nurse there. This is going to be my fourth year. I am a certified school nurse. Um, I've also been a pediatric nurse for the past 23 years, and I'm also um, certified as a pediatric nurse. Thank you, Kimberly. Next, Sarah Spengler. Please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Sarah Spengler. I'm a nurse practitioner at Community Health and Dental Care currently. I was also a pediatric nurse in the pediatric ICU at Hopkins and then at CHOP for about eight years before I started my career as a nurse practitioner for the last five years. I'm really happy to be here answering questions um, and helping people make the best choice for their families. Thank you, Sarah. And finally, Kathleen Seeley, please introduce yourself to our audience. Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm Kathleen Seeley. I'm the Senior Early Education Director at the YWCA Tri-County Area. Um, I've been working in the early education field for over 25 years, and I've worked in Maine and Pennsylvania and across the country training teachers, early education teachers. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Kathleen. Our goal this evening is to have a conversation about getting our children back to school safely. We hope to answer your questions and concerns to enable you as parents and guardians to make informed decisions on vaccinations for your children as we approach the beginning of a new school year. 
We will begin our dialogue with our panelists this evening by providing some general information about questions regarding COVID-19 vaccines for children. Sarah Spangler, can you tell us what COVID-19 vaccines have been authorized for children, specifically age range, dosage, and shots? Yeah, it's a great question, Jeff. Thanks for starting. Um, so for ages 12 to 18, um, the vaccine that's approved is the Pfizer vaccine. And that is a two dose series, an mRNA vaccine that will be given um, with the first dose, um, given three weeks, and then three weeks later, we would get the second dose for that child. Thank you. And can you also tell us if side effects are any different for children than adults? Yeah, and that's a good question too. So we always want to know about side effects. Um, they are not drastically different um, between children and adults. Um, not everybody will experience side effects, but it's common to have side effects such as feeling tired, um, having a headache, some muscle aches, and sometimes a low grade fever. Vaccine side effects are most likely to occur in the first day to two after you've had the vaccine, um, but can go up to about a week out from the vaccine. Um, and it, you know, these are treatable with like a Tylenol or a Motrin um, to help with a little bit of comfort. It's important to remember that part of the reason we see side effects with vaccines is because your immune system is doing some work. Um, and so as it's doing a little bit of work, sometimes we get a little bit of these um, side effects. Thanks very much, that's great to know. Kim, can you explain to us why it is important for children to be vaccinated given the low risk of children getting COVID-19? Sure, that's an excellent question. Um, even though COVID-19 is usually seen in adults, it's still seen in children. Um, with COVID-19, there can be complications and long-term uh, symptoms that can affect your children's health. Um, and children can transmit the virus to others even when they're not showing symptoms. So it's important to um, think of yourself, your children and the community in general um, to know that they all have the chance of um, spreading the virus and not even knowing that they have it. No question. Thanks very much for that. The CDC has a recommended immunization schedule for children. Kim, can you please speak to this? Sorry. So the immunization um, schedule for children um, is that all children entering school should have four doses of the um, DTaP vaccine, which is the diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, with one dose being given after the fourth birthday. The um, polio vaccine, which is also four doses and one dose given after the fourth birthday, two doses of the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, three doses of the hepatitis vaccine, and two doses of the chicken pox vaccine. When children enter seventh grade, they should have one dose of the tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis vaccine, and one dose of the meningococcal vaccine. And then when they enter 12th grade, um, they'll be required to have one more dose of the meningitis vaccine. And these, these vaccines are required? Yes, they are required by the state. Thank you. Our panelists will now provide us with information on required vaccines for school and early education programs in addition to COVID-19 vaccines. Sarah, can school required vaccines be given at the same time as the COVID-19 vaccine? Yeah, Jeff, the short answer to that one is yes. Um, so that really helps with a lot of convenience because we all know how hard it is to get out the door with kids. Um, so when you come to your uh, primary care provider for a well visit and they're getting their other shots, we can give the COVID-19 vaccine at that visit as well. Well, that's terrific. Kim, can you also tell us what are the required vaccines for school? Sorry. So they were the ones that I had just gone over. The DTaP, which is diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, the polio, the hepatitis B, the MMR, which is the measles, mumps, and rubella, the um, varicella, which is the chicken pox vaccine, and um, the meningococcal vaccine, um, which covers the um, 
A, C, W, and Y, um, meningitis. Terrific, thanks very much. Sure. Kathleen, what are the required vaccines for early education programs? So to they're really the same as Kim was just sharing. Um, vaccines start with very young children and um, throughout their, their time in an early education center, there are a variety of times that they need to, to continue getting those vaccines up until the time that they go to elementary school. Thanks very much. Certainly important to understand that information and be able to keep your children safe by keeping them on a schedule to get the vaccines as noted. Kim and Sarah, uh, can you guys explain what the difference is between MCV, meningococcal B, and HPV? How about if Kim goes first? Sure, so the MCV vaccine um, is a meningococcal vaccine and that's the one that's required for school um, that covers the A, C, W, and Y um, meningitis. The meningitis B vaccine is a vaccine that can be given to children, I believe it's 12 and up, Sarah, you can correct me if I'm incorrect with that. Um, and the other one that the meningitis B vaccine is not required for school. Um, and the HPV vaccine, which protects against um, the human papillomavirus, um, and that is not required for, for school either. So like I said before, the only one that is required for school is the um, meningococcal that covers the ACWMY meningitis. Thanks very much, Kim. Sarah, can you add? Yeah, Kim gave a great summary. So that's a really good um, synopsis of kind of what you would expect. So when you come in for your 11 year old um, well visit with your primary care provider, um, that's when we often take the opportunity to give um, Tdap, um, the meningitis vaccine um, and the HPV vaccine um, at that visit. Um, the meningitis vaccine that is required for the schools that Kim alluded to covers for four different strains of meningitis, and there's um, five leading strains that cause meningitis. And um, meningitis is a brain infection that um, is fast and furious, um, so it really can uh, get your child very ill very quickly before there's even a chance to have medical intervention at a hospital in some cases. Um, so it's a really important protection that we give our kids, um, which is just a, a really great privilege to be able to keep kids healthy that way. Um, and then the, the meningitis B vaccine that Kim alluded to, that one's not required by the school, but it does offer um, protection against that fifth common strain of meningitis. So it's an important one to talk about with your, your child's provider. And lastly, the HPV vaccine um, is something that we strongly recommend for children. It's the only vaccine that protects against cancer. Um, currently, there's nine different strains of uh, HPV that it protects against, and it offers lifelong protection um, from, from cancer-causing viruses. So it's a, really, it's a really great thing to get your kids. Okay, we're gonna continue. Um, our next topic is vaccine resources and general information. Before we get to our questions in the chat, our panelists will provide us with information on what schools are doing to ensure the safety of our children and where parents can go to access vaccines for their children. Kathleen, can you and then Kim share what are the child care centers and schools doing to ensure the health and safety of our youth? Sure, this is so important. Um, we are, child care centers are really, and early education centers, I should say, are really um, focused on preventative measures. So everything that we can do, in, including having families monitor their children for symptoms before bringing them into the early education center or child care center. Um, we check temperatures 
uh, and really uh, promote a lot of hand washing upon arrival um, at certain times throughout the day. We're washing common areas such as doorknobs or telephones or toys that children play with a lot often throughout the day. Um, we're working to keep children together with a cohort of other children and teachers. So there's not an opportunity to mix with many children. Um, we're really working on sharing with families all the things that they can do and all of the resources just like this town hall to get information to help them be safe with their children. Um, we are really thinking about things like mealtime and creating social distancing because often early education centers have a social mealtime where children eat as if they're a family. Uh, and so some they're using partitions at the table to divide but keep an area where children can see each other. Um, again, hand washing is crucial. Uh, if a child does become sick, we do isolate them away from other children and contact families. Um, we keep updated emergency contact information so that we can reach families if we need to. Um, and we're cleaning and disinfecting all the time. Uh, it, it's amazing to see how mask wearing and doing all of the things that we've talked about has reduced the amount of infection in early education centers um, colleagues of mine are, are astonished at the number of diseases that we've, we've really mitigated using hand washing and all of those um, preventative strategies. Thanks, Kathleen. That's really incredible. And as we all know, um, early education is the foundational elements for school and also for health. So not only are you preparing children for kindergarten, but also preparing them to live healthfully, and uh, stay clean and sanitary. And needless to say, that's been a big piece of um, the guidance as it relates to uh, the COVID-19 situation that we've had in this country. Kim. So for the schools, um, we are going to be continuing to do the um, ACIT testing. So if um, parents are interested in having their students um, tested for COVID on a weekly basis, you can sign up online to do that. If we have students that are symptomatic, um, we will offer, offer testing to parents for that as well, which will be um, the permission will be completed with an online form. Um, the water fountains are up and running again, so they are going to be disinfected regularly. Um, as for masking, we will be going by the um, guidance of the county, and um, we encourage parents to keep their students home when they're not feeling well. Um, that's the best way to, you know, keep everybody um, well. There are going to be hand sanitizers sanitizing stations available for students so that they're able to sanitize their hands on a regular basis. And then like, um, we'll also have the social distancing in place as best as we're able to. Oops. You're on mute, Jeff. Thank you. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, over the course of the last year and a half, with all of the mask wearing and sanitation, washing hands constantly, that the incidence of the, of the flu virus has been minimal. So, so we certainly hope that it will continue in the future. Uh, Sarah and Kim, can you tell us where parents can go to get vaccines for children? Sarah first. Yeah, um, so uh, I work at Community Health and Dental Care, and um, we do provide the, the vaccine for children there. Um, when you're looking for a vaccine provider, you want to, uh, for your child, you want to make sure that there, it's a place that carries the Pfizer vaccine, most importantly. Um, but if you're looking for a place in Pottstown, you can come on down to Community Health and Dental Care at Coventry Mall. Thanks. Kim. So as Sarah said, um, the most important place to go would be your primary care physician. Um, secondly, the um, 
Montgomery Health, County Health Department will be opening again um, for vaccines. So you're able to go online and um, register for an appointment though. They'll, they'll be opening in August for those, but it, you're able to go online now. For students needing vaccines for seventh grade or after um, the CVS Minute Clinic. So the closest one to Pottstown would be in Collegeville. They also offer the vaccines that are needed. Thank you. This is most definitely the time for parents to uh, schedule an appointment for, the, for their child to get a vaccine, uh, provided they're uh, 12 and over. Um, but if, if that happens now, there's another dose that has to happen in three weeks, and then they'll be ready for school. I want to remind our audience that there's a resource guide at the end of the presentation that lists COVID-19 vaccine registration phone numbers at call centers in Berks, Chester, and Montgomery counties, and also a general vaccine registration call center phone number for Montgomery County. Please be sure to refer to that information at the end of the presentation. Now we will move to some questions that came in from registrants pr prior to this evening, as well as from the chat. Our panelists are welcome to respond. Sarah, when will vaccines be available for children under 12? Yeah, that's a great question um, because we all know that it's available now for 12 and up. Um, and so the question is when, we're, when will we be able to give it to younger children? Um, the next group of children that, will, that are being studied and would, would then be eligible once it's approved would be ages six to 12. Um, that's gonna be the next release of, of data. They are predicting that um, data to happen sometime in the early to mid winter months at this point. Um, so until then, we're going to be following a lot of the great guidance that Kathleen talked about um, for our younger children. Um, it's also important to note that a lot of times um, we've found that community transmission of COVID lines up with what's happening at the schools. So what we can do to help the younger children who are not vaccinated is um, you know, take good care of our community. Um, so the, the, the more things that we can do to mitigate the virus in our community, the better off the schools will be. No question. And follow the guidance as it's written by the CDC. And I'm sure the school districts will be coming out with some information reasonably shortly. Um, one more for Sarah here, and then we'll move to another panelist. How do I know I'm doing the right thing if I get my child vaccinated for COVID? I'm scared of the long-term effects. Yeah, and it's a question I hear a lot in the clinic. I think it's a great question. Um, we as parents always want to do what's best for our kids. So it's something that I'm glad to hear parents asking and talking about. Um, a lot of the experts are saying, you know, Dr. Paul Offit is an expert at CHOP with vaccines and infections. Um, and it's kind of looking like at this point, we have two choices. You get the vaccine or you get the disease in the next couple of years. Um, and with that being our choices, it's, it's much preferable to get the vaccine. Um, there are long-term complications with uh, COVID disease that um, can affect both children and adults. So I, I think that with the safety profile that we are seeing from uh, all the data that is being poured out with um, the number of vaccines that have already been administered, um, it's you know a, a choice that each family needs to make. Um, and, you know, I, I encourage families to ask questions. So if, if you do still have questions, even after this town hall, um, I encourage you to go to your primary care provider and uh, have that conversation with them um, because you, you need to feel comfortable. You need to have your questions answered. Hey, Jeff, you're on mute. Oh, excuse me for being on mute. Um, thanks very much for that information. Kim, here's another question we'd like you to respond to. 
do our kids need to go need to be vaccinated in order to go to school or is it just parent required? It is just parent required at this point in time. There have been um, no um, recommendations for um, students to be vaccinated. Right, so in order to attend school, a child does not have to be vaccinated at this point in time. Correct, they do not need to be vaccinated against COVID-19 to enter school. Thank you. Anything coming into the chat? Nothing in the chat yet, Jeff. Um, so we can we can proceed with uh, the, the questions through registration for now. Wait, we, did, we do just have we're almost one, finished one, with those. I have we have one just come through um, from Diana Newhart. The question is: Do you anticipate schools closing in case? in the case that there are outbreaks during the school year. Kim, what do you say? So with all of the information um, with COVID, we um, give all of the information on COVID cases to um, the Office of Public Health and we work with them very closely if we do have any students or families that have COVID. So it would be based upon their guidance as to whether or not we close and that would be based upon cases of COVID. Thank you. Uh, here's another from the chat. Um, Kathleen, if you can respond to this, kids under six years and under are required to wear a mask in school. That's a question. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Um, in if there are a variety of, of um, programs that legislate what we do and um, the Office of Child Development and Early Learning, which is has oversight over early education programs in the state, um, recommends strongly that children six years and under do wear masks. Um, under at from I'm sorry from two over two to six actually depending on what ages are served in the early education centers. Um, so it is strongly encouraged, and the the data from the CDC um, supports the use of masks. Um, although there are a lot of other ways to socially distant and keep children apart, um, but still able to see each other. Um, there are wonderful panels that you can purchase that can you're able to see through, but able to keep that the germs at bay. Um, and so I think as COVID has progressed or, or invaded our, our society, if you will, um, we I think everyone has found ways to really try to make this the best for young children. Um, children watch adults and they watch their faces and they, they learn from our affect, how we look. If we're scared, if our body says we're scared, they understand that. And if our body says we're happy, um, we really have to emphasize that when a mask is on so they can see eyes and really try to understand what that person is feeling. Um, so the, 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 there is not a, an absolute answer at this time. I think everyone has spoken to the fact that we're waiting for data to come in and a decision to be made. Um, but again, in early education, the recommendation is strongly recommended to wear masks. And I know that the Montgomery County Health Department is following the guidance of the CDC. And some of that information changes somewhat regularly. And I know that uh, as, as things change, they're updated. Sarah, can you help us with this next question? Um, I've heard that vaccine side effects usually happen when the first the first few months after receiving the vaccine, and that gives experts confidence that we would have seen likely long term side effects. Is that true? Yeah, that's a really great question and, and spot on. Um, so the the vast majority of vaccine side effects happen in the first 24 or 48 hours. And this isn't just true of the COVID vaccine. Um, this is what I tell parents from the very beginning um, when they bring their babies to me and they're getting their first sets of vaccines. It's That's across the board with vaccines. And it, it does give experts reassurance 
um, that, you know, if we were going to see a problem, a side effect, a complication, um, at this point, you know, we, we would have seen it um, because of all the safety data we have on ju not just the COVID-19 vaccine, but also previous vaccines and how they've behaved in people and how, what, you know, they've caused with people too. Thanks very much. Kathleen, is there going to be a period in school where they would not need to wear a mask, six-year-olds and under? Another really good question. Um, and I would defer to Kim to talk about children five and six in kindergarten, um, as I know that the, the um, requirements and regulations are different. Um, we're really working for, looking for ways for children not to have to be masked. Um, outside at this point, as long as children are not really on top of each other, um, it's, it's really, it appears to be working well for children to not have masks on, which is a wonderful thing. Um, and they really enjoy being outside. Again, like I said a little bit earlier, there are lots of ways to keep children at a safe distance. So they're not going to need to wear masks. Um, Mealtime is a great example. It's a wonderful time for children to learn about each other and how to take turns and how to have a, a social conversation. And that's a time when children obviously are not wearing masks. And so finding a way to seat them so that they have enough space between each other or use those panels I was talking about earlier so they can see each other but still remain safe from the germs that are, that are being passed. Um, and so um, our, our, our hope is that we're gonna have more opportunities than not to be able to have children not wearing masks all the time. And, and I know that some of the current guidance from the CDC states that children who are vaccinated do not need to wear a mask unless they're riding a school bus. So uh, needless to say, uh, when the vaccine is available for younger children, yes. that will have an impact on the things that you were just discussing. Thank you very much. Kim, here's, here's a, uh, a school parent. Will parents be required to wear masks at any school functions and pick up and drops, drop offs if they are vaccinated? As for masks for the school, I can't really answer that question right now. Um, the COVID situation changes so frequently that we'll be going by the guidance of the state and the health department to make our decision. Um, as of right now, um, per the state, if you are fully vaccinated, you do not have to wear a mask. Correct. Thank you. Sarah, does a parent or legal guardian need to be present for the teen 12 to 17 to receive the COVID-19 vaccine? Answer that, and I'll, and I'll ask you the second part of the question. Okay. Um, the, the quick answer is yes. <laughs> Thank you. What protocol do you follow when the parent legal guardian is not available? Yeah, you know, as men, it was mentioned earlier that this is a vaccine that is um, consented for by the parent, um, and that, you know, that's an important part of this is that discussion with parents and, and as a family to make that choice together. Um, because it is a, a, you know, a vaccine, we always require that a parent, you know, is, is there, is consenting and notified of the vaccine being given. Um, and it's an, uh, another opportunity to be present and ask questions um, about, you know, the vaccine and any questions you might have a reminder about the side effects or whatever um, last minute questions you have. Um, you know, I do understand that it might be a hindrance to scheduling wise. It's tough with our teens who are busy um, to kind of get them in for that. Um, so there are some places that are trying to make it as easy as possible um, with things like walk-in appointments, um, or, you know, as mentioned before, it can be a great opportunity to get caught up on your well visit, make sure you're getting your other vaccines, get it, the COVID vaccine at that same time um, so that you're not having to do another trip. Um, so there's, there's other creative workarounds to try and make it more convenient, but yes, we do need that parent present to give the COVID vaccine. Thank you, thank you very much. Kim, if, if a child in school gets COVID or is discovered to have COVID, will all parents be notified? Parents will be notified if their child was in the same classroom or was a close contact of a child or 
teacher that's positive for COVID. Um, we do not send out an email to everybody in the school. We just send it out to those who could be impacted by it. Thank you. Any more questions in the chat? Hey Jeff, I do have one more. Um, this come through the question and answer function. Um, this is, do vaccinated teachers who are asymptomatic but learn that they are COVID positive through testing have to quarantine for 10 days in the same way that unvaccinated or symptomatic people do? Kim, what, what can you tell us? So if somebody is, um, even if they've been vaccinated and they test positive for COVID, they will need to um, quarantine. Um, if you are vaccinated, the only time you would be tested though is if you're doing assurance testing or if you're showing symptoms of COVID. Usually if you're vaccinated and asymptomatic, you're not tested. Right, right. Thank you very much. John, any other questions? Well, that's all the all the questions we have for now. All right, so we're all we're all caught up. So um, we got one that just came in. Are teachers required to be vaccinated? Kim, did you hear that? There's I did. A question or two. Um, as of right now, they are not required to be vaccinated, um, but a majority of our teachers are vaccinated. Keep the questions coming, everyone. We'll try to answer them as best we can. We certainly hope that uh, we can have the school year begin with uh, children enthused about what's going to happen, as well as teachers and parents. Um, and needless to say, we need to do all that we can to be sure that uh, everyone's ready. And if children are 12 or over, that they get vaccinated. Um, and when the vaccinations are available for younger children, uh, certainly um, all the guidance will indicate uh, that it, it's, it's, it's in their best interest to have them vaccinated. More questions, please don't be uh, shy about uh, typing in. Sarah, here's a question. Will there be routine testing of students, especially those under the age of 12? Yeah, I think I, I uh, may defer to, to Kathleen and Kim on this as well, but um, as far as like school policies and that piece of it, um, but you know, I would encourage families, if you notice your child having symptoms consistent with COVID to call your PCP and uh, talk about whether or not a test makes sense for them. Um, but as far as any routine testing, I think I'll let uh, our other panelists speak to that. Kim or Kathleen? So we do have the option to do the assurance testing in the school. So parents are able to sign up um, to have the assurance testing done on their students for testing to be done on a routine basis. Kathleen? Hi, I'm not aware that early education centers or child care centers are doing routine testing, but we are encouraging families to have their children tested at community sites or at their PCP um, if they develop symptoms or if they have any question at all um, or are concerned. Thank you. Here's, here, here's a question for Kim and anyone else who would like to also answer. Will if a child in school gets COVID, will the whole classroom be sent home and be quarantined? So if a child in the classroom um, develops COVID, no, the whole classroom will not be quarantined. Um, those that are within the um, parameters of six feet for 15 minutes or greater with or without a mask um, will be quarantined. The rest of the class will be just um, informed to monitor for symptoms. Thank you. Here's, here's a question for each of our panelists. 
Have any of you seen or heard that school-age children have had the Delta variant in our region? Sarah? Yeah, um, that's a great question. We hear about the Delta variant on the news a lot. Um, it's here, uh, it's in Montgomery County. So I can't specifically speak to uh, your exact question of have school-aged children tested positive for Delta variant. I don't, I can't say I have the data on that, but what I can say for sure is that it is in Montgomery County um, in our, our tri-county area. And we know that uh, schools mimic the community with spread of COVID. So if the adults in our society, in our area, in our region have the Delta variant, we can know for sure that it is circulating amongst the kids as well. Um, so it just is a great reminder for all of us that, um, you know, the way that we act as a community that, and the way that we um, choose to mitigate this virus um, has an impact on our schools. And so it's a great opportunity for uh, the adults in our community and, and other people in our community to kind of step up and see what else we can do to, to bring that level down within our own community to help protect our children. Thank you. A related question in the Q&A, um, does, does the Delta variant pose any threat to the opening of schools or potential outbreaks later in the school year that could result in another complete quarantine? Great question. So with that, we are constantly monitoring the situation in Pottstown. Um, and with that, we go by the guidance of the health department um, in regards to whether or not you know, we need to close schools. So as of right now, everything is changing um, sometimes on a daily basis. So that's not really a question that can be answered right now. Another question in the chat. When the vaccine is available for all ages, will it be a required vaccine added to the already list of vaccines that are required to attend school? or will it just be recommended? Sarah? Yeah, and that's a great question. And I think it's another one that we might be ahead of ourselves on it. Um, at this point, it is not required for school. Um, and I, you know, I, I can't speak to what decisions will happen in the future. Kim, would you like to add anything or Kathleen? I think Sarah covered it. Um, we really don't know. Um, if it will be or not. Well, we've had, had some outstanding questions come in from our audience and certainly welcome more. If there's anything else you'd like to have some conversation about, please set, put it in the chat for us so we can respond. Um, and we certainly look forward to the school year beginning. It's been quite a while since children have been in the classroom and uh, we hope that the, the environment environment will be such that that indeed is going to be what takes place. John. One more question uh, from the chat. Is there an online resource that we can share with families in Monco that provides places for them to have their 12 year and up students get the vaccine? Kim, can you can you help us out there? Um, I don't currently have a list, but um, anywhere that's giving the COVID vaccine, um, you can go, you can go to the health department. Um, a lot of the CVS locations are giving it. Um, you can check with your primary caregivers, as Sarah said, um, community health and dental is giving the vaccine. So um, something important to do is to call um, your primary care provider and ask them if they are giving the vaccines. I'm not aware of how how many are, but um, those are a few options of places that you can go. And, and also for our audience, we, we did mention that at the end of the presentation, there is information on vaccine registrations. Uh, there are call centers listed with phone numbers in Berks County, Chester County, and Montgomery County, and also a general vaccine registration number at the Montgomery County Vaccine Call Center. So please check that. At the, at the conclusion of the presentation. It's included in the PowerPoint, and that may lead you to some opportunities to get your child vaccinated. Another question, thank you. 
The county sites are open. Bethel Community Church on Kime Street in Pottstown is open for COVID-19 vaccines. Thank you very much, Holly, for sharing that information. Certainly something that our community members want to look into. All right, we've got a, we've got a couple more questions here. Um, in terms of guidance for the county, does the local state guidance supersede the guidance of the CDC? How are y'all handling choosing which guidance measures to follow? So for this school, we take all of the information into consideration when we make our decisions as to um, what guidance to follow, but we usually follow what the, um, the county puts out there. And as for early education and childcare settings, we thought um, OCTEL, the Office of Child Development and Early Learning, looks at all of the data and really sends us the guidance that we are asked to follow if we're a licensed early education center. Thank you, Kathleen. Continue with your questions. One, one more here. Um, Excellent. Things get to the, the, the uncertainty that, that many people are, are feeling about the vaccine. Is there any evidence that kids experience long-term effects from COVID infections? Yeah, I'm happy to speak to that a little bit. Um, uh, so it, we're, we've been very fortunate in this pandemic that as many of you know, children usually get a mild form of the illness and especially in comparison to the elderly or people with complicated um, medical problems. Um, however, we have learned that this is unfortunately not the case for every child. Um, and there are certainly cases of children who have the complication uh, known as MISC, uh, which is a multi inflammatory syndrome in children. Um, and it, it can, you know, land children in the hospital and in the ICU. Um, we are seeing with the kids who get MISC that they do seem to have some of the, what they call like the long haul or COVID symptoms where maybe there's some trouble with um, processing and memory um, going down the road. So again, these are extremely rare complications, um, but at this point, we, it's something that we consider a vaccine preventable disease in children ages 12 and up. Um, and so it's easier to be the parent um, uh, to, to have that knowledge in your mind um, as you're making choices about uh, vaccines for your child. Well put, Sarah. Thanks very much for that response. Certainly, with all the information out, um, parents have a responsibility to do what's best for their child. And we hope that this evening has helped to clarify and answer questions uh, as we move toward the beginning of the school year. Um, Let's continue with our questions. Well, it looks as though we're coming to the end. Um, and again, I encourage parents to continue with the uh, questions in the chat. John, do you have one? No, I think we've, we've We've reached the end of our questions here and- um... Terrific. Well, I, 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 hope, uh, I hope this evening was as valuable to you as the audience members as it was to the panel and to myself. Many of us have heard the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. I do not know of any more appropriate reminder that we are all in this together and need to do everything that we can to nurture and protect the most precious resource in our community which is our children. Thank you for joining us this evening. I hope the information shared by our panel will help you in making informed decisions for your children. Should you have any further questions on this topic, contact your local school district nurse. Have a safe and productive school year. And thank you again for joining us this evening. John? Yes, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, and to our moderator and panelists for, for this important conversation. Uh, as we exit the session, we'll leave some contact information up as, as Jeff had mentioned, um, phone numbers there for vaccine registration and more information about routine vaccines. Um, 
And we'll also be following up with a, a post town hall email that includes a link to the recording session, uh, the, the entire session here, and more resources on a safe return to school. So have a great night and stay well. Thanks.